you will hear from our director, Richard Cordray. Following Director Cordray's opening remarks, we will hear from Dana Miller of the Bureau's Office of Regulations. Ms. Miller will, will provide an overview of the remittance rule and its key requirements. Ms. Miller will also answer many of the questions we have received about the rule. In the next few days, we will post a complete recording of this webinar, along with a PDF of Ms. Miller's slides, on our website. Note, however, that we will not be able to respond to questions submitted on our blog or via email during this session. Ms. Miller will provide our contact info at the conclusion of her remarks. Now I'd like to turn the presentation over to, direct, to Director Cordray. Thank you, Eric. Thank you so much for joining us today to discuss the remittance transfer rule. Thousands of institutions have responded to our webinar invitation, including large and small institutions from across the country. We also have people watching overseas today from countries such as Taiwan, Italy, the United Kingdom, and Colombia, among others. This event is part of a broader effort on our part to help you comply with our rules. At the Consumer Bureau, after we publish new rules, we will not simply move on and leave the burden of compliance for others to bear. Instead, we intend to work with you by offering guidance and assistance to help you implement our rules. In addition to this event, we recently published a small business compliance guide for the remittance rule. This guide seeks to present the rule and its requirements in an easy-to-read document to assist banks and non-banks alike. This guide is a first draft, and we're currently taking feedback. Please let us know what you think. We want to make it as user-friendly as we can, and we will use your suggestions to improve it. Members of our team will present to you in just a few moments. They're traveling the country, speaking to many remittance transfer providers. Our team has also offered guidance in response to questions received from providers and trade groups. We recently released a safe harbor list of countries that providers can rely on to apply one of the rule's exceptions. We welcome your suggestions for countries to be added to that list. Details about the Small Business Guide and the Countries list are on our website at consumerfinance.gov. It's important to remember why we're here in the first place. Congress passed a law that requires basic consumer protections and transparency in the marketplace for sending money abroad. This is only fair. Americans already expect and receive basic consumer protections every time they write a check or use a credit card. The same should be true when people send money outside the country. In the past, consumers in this situation typically received limited information. Unknown fees and taxes and undisclosed exchange rates meant that consumers often did not know the price of the transaction and did not know how much money would be received on the other end. The new law and our new rule will increase the information available to consumers who will now know all of the fees, taxes, and exchange rates ahead of payment. People can know how much is to be received and they can shop around for the best deal. These consumer protections are needed, and like all consumer protections, they will benefit the financial industry if the result is greater trust in the marketplace. If we can succeed in making these transactions more transparent, they will attract more customers who can compare options and achieve lower costs and reduced risk. Trust, confidence, and clear rules of the road are necessary for the efficient functioning of any market, and the same is true here. The rule aims to reduce risk to consumers by holding remittance providers accountable for errors. Under the rule, as outlined in the statute, if a consumer reports a problem with a transaction within 180 days, the provider must investigate and correct any errors. Note that under the rule, providers may be held responsible for some mistakes made by their agents. We know this aspect of the rule has raised concerns, and we agree with some of the concerns that have been expressed particularly where a consumer provides incorrect account or routing information. In those circumstances, though we think the provider should be responsible for trying to remedy the situation, if the money was properly transmitted in accordance with the sender's instructions and cannot be recovered, we share concerns about liability resting on the provider. We expect to take action shortly to address this issue. The law generally requires providers to disclose the actual amount to be received by the recipient. To do so, providers have to disclose the exchange rate, third-party fees, and foreign taxes that apply to the transaction. For banks and other depository institutions, if they cannot know the exchange rate at the time the transfer is requested, they're permitted to estimate it. Congress, however, did not provide for broad estimates of unknown taxes or fees. 
We realize disclosures of fees and taxes are proving to be a difficult requirement, and we're considering whether we can facilitate industry efforts to figure out the correct tax information. We welcome your input on this issue. We also appreciate those foreign banks that are working to assist remittance providers in making accurate disclosures about fees. Our remittance rule becomes effective on February 7, 2013, about four months from now. The rule only applies to remittances made by individuals, not those by businesses. It will apply to most electronic transfer of funds over $15. Note that the rule does not apply to you if you provide 100 or fewer remittances each year. We understand that adjusting to the law Congress has passed and the rule we've written to implement that law is not an easy task. We want to help you understand how to comply with the remittance rule. If you have questions, please submit them at CFPB underscore remittance rule at CFPB.gov. Or you can go to our website, consumerfinance.gov, and you can find links to where to submit your questions. The team that's going to present more detail to you about the rule is working diligently to respond to your questions, and I know they will continue to do so. Now I'm going to turn it over to our experts who will walk you through the remittance rule and answer many of the questions we have received. It's our pleasure to be with all of you today. We now will be transferring you to a PowerPoint presentation. Dana Miller of our Office of Regulations will walk you through that in just a few moments. Thank you, Director Cordray, for your remarks, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dana Miller. I am a senior counsel in the Office of Regulations at the CFPB, and first want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to call in today or to listen online. We know there's a lot of interest in the remittances rule and hope that this over overview will be helpful as you figure out whether or not you have compliance obligations under the rule and as you're working to implement the rule's requirements. As Director Cordray mentioned, we have a large number of listeners today. Many of you are at different stages of implementing the rule. So to level set, today I'm going to provide an overview of the rule that will tackle some of the basics. But at the same time, I will be getting to, into the weeds on some of the trickier parts. And to that end, a number of listeners submitted questions in advance of this webinar, and we thank you for that. Rather than saving questions until the end, we thought it might make more sense to address them in the course of the overview as we're discussing various topics. Of course, I do need to give the disclaimer that this is staff guidance and not any official interpretation of the Bureau or legal advice. Official interpretations are incorporated in the staff commentary to the rule. And with that, let's address why are you listening today? So in 2010, the Dodd-Frank Act expanded the scope of the Electronic Fund Transfer Act to impose requirements regarding certain international fund transfers. These transactions are referred to in the statute as remittance transfers. To implement the new Dodd-Frank Act requirements, the CFPB issued a new rule that generally requires companies that provide remittance transfers to give their customers certain disclosures. The rule also establishes cancellation and error resolution procedures. The transactions covered by the rule are, car are called remittance transfers or remittances, but your customers also may refer to them by other names, such as international money transfers or international wires. The CFPB's rule has been issued in three parts. I'm putting up the sites for the Federal Register notices here on this slide and a link to our website where you can find them so you can access them easily. And to make things easier, we have also added an unofficial PDF of the complete rule and official interpretations on our website at this link. For those who are newer to the rule, this slide contains the key questions that you should be thinking about. And in today's presentation, I'm going to go over all of these in detail. The first three questions relate to whether or not providers are subject to the rule in the first place. First, do you offer consumers a way to send money abroad? If so, are the transfers you provide remittance transfers under the rule? And if so, are you a remittance transfer provider? I will be talking about each of these factors today. But generally speaking, 
If the answer to any of these questions is no, then you do not have compliance obligations under this rule. If, however, the answer to all of these questions is yes, you will need to comply with the rule. And if that's the case, the next three questions are the key legal questions you will need to consider. And those are, what are your disclosure obligations? What cancellation rights do senders have? And what are your error resolution obligations? We are going to discuss all of these today. This next slide addresses the first two key questions. Do you offer consumers a way to send money abroad? And are the, the transfers that you send remittance transfers? To start off, a remittance transfer is defined by the statute, and the rule closely tacks the language of the statute. A remittance transfer is an electronic transfer of funds requested by a sender to a designated recipient that is sent by a remittance transfer provider. You need to have all of these elements in order for there to be a remittance transfer. That said, this is a very broad definition, and it generally applies whether or not the sender holds an account and whether or not the transfer is an electronic fund transfer. So it covers more than just your traditional worker remittances. The rule covers many types of international transfers, such as cash-to-cash -cash money transfers, international wire transfers, international ACH transactions, and certain prepaid card transfers. And I'll get into this in more detail shortly, but first let me get back to the definitions. Uh, as I said, the definition of remittance transfer covers an electronic transfer of funds. So focusing on the word electronic, where a provider issues a check, draft, or other paper instrument to be mailed abroad, that is generally not electronic and so is not covered by the rule. With respect to online bill payments, generally, online bill payments are sent electronically. However, sometimes the bill pay service will instead disperse a check from the consumer's account. And the comment to the definition of remittance transfer provides, among other things, that this is not an electronic transfer of funds if the provider explicitly states that such a payment will be made solely by a check and in particular, a check drawn from a consumer's account. We've received questions about checks drawn instead from omnibus accounts. So in some instances, a bank's bill payment process processes result in the check technically being drawn on an omnibus account at a bank rather than directly from the consumer's account, although the funds will in fact be debited from the consumer's account. We do not believe that this technical difference should result in a different application of the exception to the rule. So, if a paper check is sent abroad by a bill pay service, and such a check is drawn on an omnibus account, the payment should be excluded from our rule. So, in addition to needing to have an electronic transfer of funds, in order to have a remittance transfer, you also have to have a sender and a designated recipient. The rule also closely tracks the statute here in terms of the definitions. A sender is a consumer in a state who primarily for personal, family, or household purposes requests a remittance transfer provider to send a remittance transfer to a designated recipient. So a sender is a consumer in a state. A state is a defined term under Regulation E that means a U.S. state, territory, or possession, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, or any political subdivision of any of these. On the other hand, a designated recipient is any person specified by a sender to receive a transfer at a location in a foreign country. A designated recipient can either be a natural person or a business entity. We received a question about why transfers to businesses are covered by the rule. This comes from the statute, which defines a designated recipient as any person. So payments sent abroad to pay for tuition or utilities, for example, could be covered. The commentary provides guidance as to when there is a sender and when there is a designated recipient for purposes of the rule. In particular, we want to note for that for account-based transfers, you would look to the location of the account, not the physical location of the consumer requesting the transfer or the recipient. Thus, if someone has a U.S. bank account and he gives an ATM card to his daughter studying abroad who can access the U.S.-based account, we don't consider that to fall within the scope of the rule. That is a U.S.-based account. On the other hand, if the daughter opens an account abroad and the parents wire funds from the U.S. to that account abroad, that may be a remittance transfer even if the daughter later comes back home to the U.S. The commentary also clarifies that the sender and the recipient may be the same person. For example, a sender may send funds from a bank account in the U.S. to a separately owned bank account abroad. That may still be a remittance transfer. We've received questions about how this applies to members of the military who are stationed on bases, uh, bases abroad. This is a highly fact-specific question, but the answer depends on whether the service member or the service member's account 
is in a U.S. state, territory, or possession as I just described it. Again, you would look to where the sender and the designated recipient are located under the rule, and you would make your determination based on that. Continuing to talk about what transactions are covered, we've also received a lot of questions about the applicability of the rule to transfers from business accounts. Generally, the rule covers consumer-to-consumer -consumer transfers and consumer-to-business transfers, as I've said. However, because there needs to be a sender, that is, a consumer, the rule does not cover business-to-consumer or business-to-business -business transfers. For example, in the final rule published in February, we point out that transfers from sole proprietor accounts would not be covered. We have also received questions about transfers from trusts, IRAs, and ERISA accounts, etc. The rule is not intended to cover transfers from an account held by a financial institution under a bona fide trust agreement, including those that qualify as a trust under the Internal Revenue Code. Where trusts are not involved, transfers initiated by someone acting with a power of attorney or who has guardianship rights may be subject to the rule. So as I've said, remittance transfers are defined broadly. The definition covers a number of different transfer methods, but generally there are two common types of examples. Those are so-called closed network transfers, such as transfers sent through a money transmitter. In a closed network, participants are linked by contract and the central player has a high level of end-to-end -end control. There are also network, open network transfers, such as international wire transfers and international ACH transactions. With these transfers, there is typically a chain of relationships in which no party generally has end-to-end -end control. There are also newer hybrid models, but these are just some general categories. The inclusion of consumer-initiated open network transfers in the rule raised a lot of comment and raised questions, but it is driven by the statute which expressly contemplates them. Not only is the definition in the statute of remittance transfer quite uh, the definition of remittance transfer in the statute quite broad, Congress also provide uh, provided for a limited temporary exception for account-based transfers from financial institutions, which is something I will be discussing later. Finally, as I mentioned earlier, the definition of remittance transfer requires that a transfer be sent by a remittance transfer provider. I'll get more into who is a remittance transfer provider shortly, but just to note that the commentary explains that this means that there must be an intermediary that is directly engaged with the sender to send an electronic transfer of funds on behalf of that sender to a designated recipient. The comment provides several examples of transactions that are not remittance transfers, and among them I want to mention a few. First, a consumer providing a debit, credit, or prepay card directly to a foreign merchant as payment for goods or services is not a remittance transfer. So for example, if you call a store in Mexico to order something to be sent to you in the U.S. and you directly give the store your credit card number and the store charges your credit card, that is not a remittance transfer. Second, consumers providing checking account numbers directly to foreign merchants where the merchant then sends an ACH payment request to the consumer's bank is not a remittance transfer. So for example, if you're paying your utility abroad directly, you provide the utility your checking account number and that utility initiates the request, that would not be a remittance transfer. In these examples, there is not an intermediary that is directly engaged with the consumer to send an electronic transfer of funds. The rule also does not require a financial institution to provide disclosures when a sender provides his account number to a third-party payment service and that payment service debits the sender's account. Again, here in this situation, the institution is not acting as an intermediary. However, in some situations, the third-party payment service may be a remittance transfer provider under the rule. The rule also has two exemptions from the remittance transfer definition that I want to mention. The first is a, a, an exemption for small value transactions. Uh, the rule excludes transfer amounts of $15 or less. In contrast, there is not a cap on the dollar amount that could be a remittance transfer. The rule also exempts transfers in connection with the purchase or sale of securities that are excluded from the definition of electronic transfer under Regulation E, 12 CFR 1005.3 C4. The commentary in Regulation E to this provision provides some examples of how this exception works. So this slide provides some examples of transfers that are and are not remittance transfers, assuming no exception applies. And I'm just going to go through, take a moment to go through these examples. 
First, where a consumer sends cash at a money transmitter located in Colorado to a business recipient in France, there is a remittance transfer. However, where a business sends cash at a money transmitter located in Colorado to a consumer recipient in France, there is not a remittance transfer. Here, the business, which is sending the funds, is not a sender under the rule. Where a consumer wires money from a bank account in California to a consumer bank account in Brazil, and where the consumer sends an international ACH from that account in California to make a mortgage payment in, in Brazil, these are remittance transfers. In those cases, you have a consumer in a state requesting funds to be transferred to recipients located in foreign countries. You'll notice in the first we example that it's a consumer recipient, and in the second example, a business recipient, but both would be remittance transfers. Moving to the next example, where a consumer sends cash at a money transmitter in California to a consumer recipient in Colorado, this is not a remittance transfer because here the recipient is not located in a foreign country. The next two examples address prepaid cards. Where the consumer buys a prepaid card in the U.S. and the provider gives or mails the prepaid card to that consumer in the U.S., the provider won't know whether the consumer will send the card abroad and so is not a directly engaged intermediary. In contrast, where the consumer buys a prepaid card in the U.S., but the provider mails that card directly to the recipient abroad, that is a remittance transfer. One final example, which I did mention earlier, where a consumer has a U.S.-based bank account and the bank mails an ATM card associated with that account to a recipient abroad, this is not a remittance transfer. Here, the ATM card is associated with account and that account is located in the U.S. Moving to the next slide. So now we've answered the first two key questions, uh, and those are, do you send money abroad, and is there a remittance transfer? The next key question is, who is a remittance transfer provider? As defined by the statute and the rule, a remittance transfer provider means any person that provides remittance transfers in the, quote, normal course of business. Normal course of business depends on the facts and circumstances under the rule, including the total number and frequency of transfers. However, in August, the CFPB adopted a safe harbor regarding this term. And a large number of our questions have come in about the safe harbor, so let's spend some time talking about this. Under the safe harbor, if a provider provided 100 or fewer remittance transfers in the prior calendar year, and 100 or fewer remittance transfers in the current calendar year, it is not providing remittance transfers in the normal course of business and will not be a remittance transfer provider under the rule. The 100 threshold, 100 transfer threshold includes all types of transfers. It is not 100 per type of transfers. So for example, if a provider sends 50 international wires and 75 international ACH transfers, the provider would count those all together and would be providing more than 100 in transfers in a year. That said, for counting to 100, you don't include transfers not covered by the rule, such as business account transfers or domestic transfers. When you're counting to 100, you only include transfers that would otherwise be covered under the rule. The rule does provide a transition period if a provider exceeds the threshold. This is different than what was proposed. The proposal would have required compliance immediately after crossing the threshold but the final rule provides a reasonable period of time not to exceed six months to come into compliance. Alternatively, if you exceed the threshold, you could still show under the facts and circumstances that you are not a remittance transfer provider. We've received some questions about the safe harbor threshold. The proposal had solicited a comment on a threshold of 25 per year, but the final rule settled on 100. The Bureau believes that 100 per year serves as a reasonable basis to identify persons who occasionally provide remittance transfers but don't provide them in the normal course. This equates to about two per week. We do expect that the, that the 100 transfer threshold will provide a meaningful, excuse me, will um, exempt a meaningful number of institutions from the rule. That said, we expect that most consumers who send remittances will continue to receive the rule's protections. We do, in any event, attend to monitor the impact of the threshold, and we welcome additional data in that regard. Let me take a moment to address three additional questions that have come in about the operation of the safe harbor. First, we've been asked whether, if a business is not a remittance transfer provider under the safe harbor, consumers have the safe rights under the rule. 
The answer is, if you are not covered by the rule, you do not have additional air, air resolution obligations beyond what you might already have. So for example, if you send ACH transactions internationally and you are not subject to the rule, consumers will still have general regulation E rights, including air resolution rights under regulation E. But this rule, the remittance rules, air resolution provisions, and other provisions of the rule will not apply to you. Second, a number of institutions have asked whether a transaction could be a remittance transfer if an institution does not send a wire directly to a bank abroad, but rather sends the wire instruction through another larger financial institution in the U.S. Other institutions have asked whether it matters that the correspondent institution provides more than 100 transfers in a year. If you use a correspondent institution to send a wire transfer abroad, yes, that transaction could be covered. What matters is that you have a sender requesting you, the institution, to send a remittance transfer to a designated recipient abroad. So you may be acting as a remittance transfer provider, even if you're using correspondent institutions to get the funds there. However, in terms of counting towards the 100 transfer threshold, you should focus on the number that you yourself are providing. If you consistently provide 100 or fewer a year, you will not be providing remittance transfers in the normal course of business, even if you are sending wires through a correspondent institution that itself sends more than 100 a year. And just to note that if you operate through various agents, you should count transactions at each agent location collectively. Finally, an institution has asked whether they can cut off international wires at a number below 100 each year. The rule does not directly address this, so it does not prohibit institution from implementing cutoffs. So let's take an example of how this works. Consider an institution that has 65 transfers in 2012, 73 in 2013, and 124 in 2014. That institution would not have to comply with the rule at all when it takes effect in 2013 because it was under 100 in both 20 th in 2012 and stayed under 100 in 2013. However, it would only be exempt in 2014 until it made the 101st transfer. As of that date, the institution would have up to six months to come into compliance unless it could show under the facts and circumstances that it was not providing remittance transfers in the normal course of business. Assuming that's not the case, transfers occurring until November 1st, 2014, six months later, would be exempt. However, any transfers after November 1, 2014 would be covered by the rule. If the 101st transfer is not made until November 1, 2014, then the six-month transition period would extend to May 1, 2015. Moving to the next slide, this is more of a practical compliance tip than legal guidance, but in thinking about whether or not you fall within the safe harbor, you should be thinking about the various places where remittance transfers might be sent across your business. So for example, if your business has uh, divisions that, um, that send transfers uh, such as your retail division, your high net worth division, commercial division, um, if you send wires, ACH, or any closed network transfers, you need to count them all together. So it may take some, um, some uh, information gathering to determine whether or not you are under the 100 uh, transfer threshold. So once you've determined that you are a remittance transfer provider sending remittance transfers, you're going to need to think about your compliance obligations under the rule. And the final rule, as I mentioned earlier, establishes a number of obligations for providers. Those include disclosure obligations, which include both providing a prepayment disclosure and a receipt, and implementing certain foreign language disclosure requirements, cancellation and refund procedure obligations, and error resolution procedure obligations. I'll discuss these requirements in the next slides along with clarifying points. And I'll mention agent liability and special rules for transfers scheduled in advance separately at the end of this discussion. So the rule generally requires two disclosures for each transfer a prepayment disclosure and a receipt. And I will explain later an alternative disclosure method that we talk about as the combined disclosure. I'm going to spend a bit of time on this slide. First, I'm going to talk a bit about the elements that are on the disclosures, and then I'll talk about timing and format. 
So the first disclosure is a prepayment disclosure, which is required prior to payment and which, among other things, includes a number of disclosures. These include the amount to be transferred, front-end fees and taxes, the exchange rate, back-end fees and taxes, and the total amount to be received. So let me go back and talk about each of these. The amount to be transferred is the amount of funds being sent to the designated recipient. This gets disclosed both in the currency in which the transfer is funded and the currency to be received by the recipient. Front-end fees and taxes are fees and taxes charged by the provider or passed on by the provider and charged to the sender. So for example, the sender's flat fee for sending a transfer and a state tax that might apply to that send. Front-end fees and taxes, together with the amount to be transferred, creates a total amount paid that reflects the amount the sender is paying out of pocket to fund the transfer. On the prepayment disclosure, you also need to disclose an exchange rate if applicable. If you have a U.S. dollar to U.S. dollar transfer, or in other words, if you're sending 100 U.S. dollars and you're asking that it be sent in dollars to a recipient abroad to be received in dollars, you don't need to disclose an exchange rate but the transfer still can be a remittance transfer. In certain cases, disclosures can be estimated, and I'll talk about this a bit more later. However, generally speaking, uh, disclosure amounts must be exact. So for the exchange rate, this means that providers can't disclose that an exchange rate is unknown, floating, or to be determined. You need to provide actual numbers that apply to a transfer. The commentary states that if a provider doesn't have specific knowledge regarding the currency in which funds will be received, the provider can rely on the sender's representation for purposes of determining whether an exchange rate is applied to the transfer. If the sender doesn't know the currency in which funds will be received, the provider can assume that the currency in which funds will be received is the currency in which the remittance transfer is funded. So let me give an example. If your customer requests that a remittance transfer be deposited into an account in U.S. dollars, you do not need to disclose an exchange rate, even if it turns out that the recipient's account is actually denominated in Mexican pesos and the funds are converted prior to deposit into the account. There's no duty for you to inquire that third party. Going back to what needs to be disclosed in the prepayment disclosure, uh, you also need to disclose back-end fees and taxes and the total amount to be received by the designated recipient. Back-end fees and taxes include any lifting fees that are charged by correspondent institutions along the chain and fees charged by the beneficiary institution that are specifically related to the remittance transfer. Disclosure of the amount to be received by the designated recipient is a statutory requirement, and thus disclosure of the other items, such as back-end fees and taxes, flow from this requirement. What the statute is requiring is for the disclosure to the consumer of the specific amount the recipient is going to be getting. So, for example, if the sender pays, pay, excuse me, if the sender sends $100 and the recipient receives $95, you generally must disclose all of the fees and taxes that are deducted from the $100 to get to $95. On fees, uh, generally, fees that are specifically related to the transfer must be disclosed. To the extent fees are being charged among intermediary parties and those fees are not being passed on to the consumer up front or on the back end, those would not need to be disclosed. On taxes, we have heard a lot of concern about the requirement to provide tax information. And again, the requirement to provide this is driven by the statute, which requires consumers to receive an accurate disclosure of the amount received. We do recognize the challenges this is presenting to industry and are working to provide further guidance where we can. To that end, we know that taxes can vary by the receipt method, recipient status, even the province where funds are received, and the commentary does provide some guidance in this respect. If a provider does not have specific knowledge regarding variables that affect the amount of taxes, the provider can rely on the sender's representations regarding these variables. If the sender does not know these variables, the provider may disclose the highest possible tax with respect to the unknown variable. Now that we've gone over all the elements in the prepayment disclosure, let me turn to the receipt. The receipt includes all of the information required in the prepayment disclosure, plus a few other things. It must disclose the date of availability. Here, an exact date is required, 
a range of dates or an estimated date is not permitted, and this comes from the statute. But particularly in the case of wires and ACH transfers, the exact date of availability may not be known. So what the rule does is permit a provider to disclose an outer limit and to provide a statement that the funds may be available sooner. There's no limit on how far out the disclosed date may be, but we anticipate that competition will keep providers from dramatically overshooting. We have received some questions about disclosing the date of availability, including regarding prepaid cards subject to the rule, and what happens where transfers may be received in a country that spans multiple time zones. That is, transfer could arrive either today or tomorrow. And even though the examples in the comment to this provision relate to international wires, the rule always permits providers to disclose the latest possible date and then state that funds may be available sooner. So for example, if you think a transfer that's sent on November 1st is going to be available on November 3rd, but you also know that it might arrive later, you can state that the date of availability is November 6th, but that the transfer may be available sooner. Going back to the receipt, also required on the receipt are the name of the designated recipient, even if the designated recipient is also the sender, and a statement about the sender's error resolution and cancellation rights. The rule provides model language for this, uh, for, for this statement. Um, the, the rule permits a short form on the receipt and a long form that must be given upon the sender's request. Finally, the receipt needs to disclose the provider's contact information and the state agency and CFPB contact information. If you're a federally regulated bank, you don't need to disclose the state agency. Only state chartered institutions and state chartered and licensed entities need to do that. But you always do need to include CFPB's contact information. Now that I've gone over what has to be in the disclosures, I'm going to talk about all the timing here. Uh, first, the prepayment disclosure must be given when the sender requests the transfer but prior to payment for the transfer. So what does this mean? Just asking, what are your rates today, isn't a request. The consumer has to request an actual transfer be made to a designated recipient. The prepayment disclosure itself is not a guarantee. So if the customer receives a prepayment disclosure and then walks out the door, and then comes back three hours later wanting to send a transfer, and in the meantime, exchange rates have changed, there is no requirement to honor that prepayment disclosure. Instead, what there is a requirement to do is to provide a new, a fresh prepayment disclosure with updated information before payment is made. Once the sender has indicated that they would like to move forward with the transfer, generally the receipt must be given when payment is made. So what does this mean? Most of the time when we talk about payment, we're talking about when funds actually are deducted from an account. And that's when I, when I say most of the time, I mean most of the time in other rules and regulations. But in this context, in the remittance rule context, that doesn't always make sense where sometimes there is a lag between authorization and funds being deducted from an account. So the comment clarifies that for purposes of this rule, payment is made, for example, when a sender provides cash to the remittance transfer provider or when payment is authorized. So if a sender requests that a financial institution send an international wire, the receipt will be provided when the payment is authorized, not when the wire is actually processed and sent out. And there are special rules for transactions conducted entirely by telephone and for mobile application and text message transactions. So let me just touch on those real briefly. If the transaction is conducted entirely by telephone, it must be mailed or delivered to the sender within one business day. However, if the telephone transaction is done from an account with the provider, as might be the case for a transfer from a consumer's bank account, the receipt can be given on the next regularly scheduled periodic statement or within 30 days after payment. And I'll refer to this timing later on as the telephone rule. Uh, now that I've talked about timing, I'm going to turn to disclosure format. Generally, under the remittances rule, disclosures need to be clear and conspicuous, in writing, and in retainable form meaning the consumer must get a copy that he or she can keep. Under the rule, there is an exception to the requirement that disclosures be given in writing. If a sender electronically makes a request to send a transfer, the provider can provide the prepayment disclosure electronically. We've received several questions about how the eSign Act works with this rule. The eSign Act, for those not familiar with it, 
is a long-standing federal law not specifically related to the remittances statute that talks about how electronic disclosures can be made. Generally, when disclosure must be provided in writing, the eSign Act permits electronic delivery of a disclosure if consumer consent and other requirements of the act are met. And we typically call this eSign consent. So under the remittances rule, generally, if a sender electronically makes a request to send a transfer, the provider can give the prepayment disclosure electronically without e-sign consent. However, to provide the receipt electronically, the provider must get e-sign consent. Otherwise, it needs to be provided in writing. In addition, nothing in the remittance rule limits the ability of a provider to provide electronic disclosures so long as the e-sign act is followed, including getting e-sign consent. So as I mentioned, generally the rule requires a prepayment disclosure and a receipt. For some transfers, the request and the payment may occur very close in time, so the rule does implement a statutory uh, a provision that permits for a single alternative combined disclosure. And the way this works is, the combined disclosure must contain the information required for a receipt, but it must be given prior to payment. Then, when payment is made, a proof of payment is required. We've been asked about various ways proof of payment can be obtained. The rule states that the proof of payment needs to be clear and conspicuous, provided in writing or electronically, and provided in a retainable form. Otherwise, the rule does not specify what the proof of payment must look like. However, the proof of payment enables a sender to demonstrate that the combined disclosure received was part of a completed transaction, and therefore the sender can assert cancellation and error resolution rights. The proof of payment also helps providers determine which transfers have actually been completed so that a sender can assert these rights without actually having paid for the transfer. So what the proof looks like depends on how you want to manage this aspect. As with the receipt, the proof of payment is given when the transfer is authorized, not when the actual payment is processed. And again, noting for purposes of this rule, payment equals authorization. We've been asked whether it would be okay for an agent to keep the proof of payment. And the answer is, while an agent can certainly keep a copy, a sender also needs to be provided proof in a retainable form. There's a slightly different regime for remittance transfers scheduled in advance of the transfer. And here, in lieu of proof of payment, you must provide a confirmation of scheduling. And I'll talk about this separately at the end of the presentation. There are also foreign language disclosure requirements which may apply. I'll go through this, uh, and then I'll give an example of how this works. So the rule requires disclosures to be given in English and either. Each foreign language principally used advertise, solicit, or market remitt remittance transfer services at a particular office, or in the language primarily used by the sender with the provider to conduct a remittance transfer, assuming it's one of the triggered languages. Note that this rule talks about an office. So newspaper ads generally don't trigger the requirement. Let me give you an example of how this works. Let's assume that Spanish, Vietnamese, and English are principally used to advertise remittances at a particular office. So, you, under the rule, you would need to give disclosures in Spanish, Vietnamese, and English. Alternatively, you would just need to give it in Spanish and English if Spanish is primarily used by the sender to conduct the remittance transfer. There are special rules here for telephone transactions. Here you must give prepayment disclosures orally in the language primarily used by the sender with the provider, even if it's not advertised, excuse me, principally used to advertise, solicit, or market. However, the receipt would just follow the normal telephone rule. The rule also imposes specific formatting requirements for disclosures, and these include proximity, grouping, font size, and segregation requirements. I won't get into these, but just will say that to help compliance, the rule provides a number of model forms that can be used. Some are designed to look like register receipts, and others are designed to look like a printout on paper. I would note that the February final rule uh, that initially published these forms along with the final rule was uh, not published correctly. So in April, there was a correction uh, that, pr that posted the uh, model forms correctly. They're also all available for download at our website at the link I provided at the beginning of the presentation. And I think I will also provide that at the end of the presentation.
As I said earlier, uh, items that are disclosed must generally be exact. However, the final rule implements two types of statutory exceptions that permit a remittance transfer to provider to disclose estimates. There is also a third exception, which I'll mention in a bit. The first exception is a temporary exception that applies to insured depository institutions and credit unions. The statute provides the temporary exception until July 21, 2015, with the potential for the CFPB to extend it for up to another five years if the Bureau determines that expiration would negatively affect the ability of these providers to provide remittance transfers. Congress limited the exception to insured institutions. Accordingly, the exception does not include providers that are not insured institutions, such as much, most money transmitters and broker-dealers, even if they send remittance transfers through open networks. The exception here, this temporary exception, applies to the provider only. If the provider obtains information from a business partner and the business partner qualifies for the exception, this does not mean that the provider also qualifies for the exception. So for example, a correspondent institution may provide estimates to its own retail customers, but that, entitle, does not, that does not entitle you as a provider to automatically provide estimates to your customers if you are obtaining information from the correspondent, but you are not yourself an insured institution. So back to how this exception works. The exception applies where the insured institution cannot determine amounts required to be disclosed for reasons beyond its control. For example, maybe your current business model doesn't permit it to know the exchange rate or back-end fees or taxes. It's worth noting that for purposes of this exception, a relationship with the direct correspondent institution is considered to be within the provider's control. So if the first correspondent with which you have a direct relationship is setting the exchange rate, the financial institution cannot take advantage of this exception. The second exception is a permanent exception that applies in two ways. It applies to any provider that cannot determine exact amounts because the laws of the recipient country or the method by which transaction, uh, transactions are made in the recipient country does not permit them to determine exact amounts. The methods exception is a limited exception that applies to international ACH transfers where the terms are negotiated between the U.S. government and the recipient country's government and where the rate is set after the fact by the country's central bank or other governmental authority. Today we understand that this primarily applies to the Directo in Mexico program. Finally, uh, in a separate permanent exception, this applies to transfers scheduled five or more business days in advance. The August rulemaking provided specific disclosure regime for those transfers, and I will talk about that in a little bit. So in terms of how these exceptions apply, several questioners have asked whether model forms can be changed to say, for example, that the exchange rate or fees and taxes, exchange rate or fees and taxes are estimated, and that the provider cannot be responsible for the receiving bank's exchange rate, fees and taxes, or alternatively, that disclosures are subject to change. The short answer is no, this is not permissible. The rule requires that specif specified disclosures be provided even if they're estimated and permitted to be estimated. Where numbers are estimated, you would indicate this by using the term estimated, EST, something of that nature, in close proximity to the disclosed number. Just talk, take a minute to talk about the countries list. The Bureau has published a safe harbor country list pr providers can rely on for purposes of the permanent exception for the laws of a recipient country. And this is up on our website, the link we provided and we'll provide a bit later. The countries and other areas on the list right now include Aruba, Brazil, China, Ethiopia, and Libya. Uh, we've been asked about how we came up with these countries. The Bureau gathered intelligence from sources in the industry, consumer groups, and other stakeholders and possible candidates for the list. And we attempted to verify the legal authorities in those countries and other areas. In particular, we inquired through diplomatic channels with the relevant regulatory and banking authorities in the candidate countries and areas to determine whether their laws do in fact prevent disclosure of exact amounts. We also consulted with other legal authorities regarding foreign laws and regulations to verify our research. In some instances, 
countries that were suggested as having laws that prevent a disclosure of exact amounts, uh, but further research indicated that the laws were not, in fact, an impediment. We do welcome suggestions on the list, and we do expect to update it on a periodic basis. Additions to this list will be effective upon release. However, to provide providers certainty when the rule goes into effect, the Bureau will not remove any countries that are on this version of the list earlier than May 1, 2013. If we believe that it's appropriate to remove a country from a list, we will also provide 90 days advance notice that the Bureau is considering changing its interpretation. Uh, uh, if the Bureau determines that it is appropriate to add an additional country or countries to the list, we will release a revised list adding those countries as soon as reasonably practical. We welcome suggestions along with supporting legal authority translated into English. Additional details on how to submit suggestions and how we'll be updating the list are on the website at the link. We've also received questions as to whether the exception for the laws of the recipient country is limited to countries with laws relating to currency. While the commentary provides examples related to currency restrictions, this rule is not specifically tied to currency. Thus, staff believes that one could read the exception also to apply to countries' data protection laws that would prohibit beneficiary banks abroad from disclosing their customers' fees to a U.S. remittance transfer provider. We would expect those laws to be specific to the disclosure of account information and that a provider could document those laws. Now that we've outlined the exceptions, let's talk about how you can actually provide estimates. There are essentially two methods for estimating under the rule. The first is to use the specific bases listed in the rule for estimating the exchange rate, transfer amount, other fees, other taxes, and the amount received. The other is a safe harbor. The safe harbor permits the use of a non-listed method as long as the recipient receives the same or a greater amount of funds that was disclosed in the estimate. So with respect to the listed methods, I'll go through a few examples. To estimate the exchange rate, the rule permits the provider several options for estimating. For example, the provider can calculate an estimate by looking to a publicly available rate and adding a margin typically applied to that country. To estimate third-party fees deducted from the amount received, an estimate must be based on either the provider's most recent transfer to the recipient's institution or a representative transmittal route identified by the provider. The commentary clarifies that the representative transmittal route is a route that leads to the designated recipient's institution, not representative beneficiary institutions. So for example, U.S. Bank A uh, sends a transfer to Foreign Bank X, that would be the route that you would look at, not U.S. Bank A to Foreign Bank X, Y, or Z. With respect to taxes, the rule permits taxes to be estimated if they are a percentage of the amount transferred to the recipient. However, taxes cannot be estimated where specific sums are assessed that are not tied to the amount transferred and that amount isn't estimated. It also it appears from questions that some believe that taxes may only be estimated where an exchange rate is estimate, and that's not entirely accurate. The comment also states that taxes can be estimated where fees are estimated, and thus those, the estimated fees would affect the amount received. Generally speaking, with estimates, the rule does not permit ranges to be provided. You must provide specific numbers. And again, there is a specific regime with respect to transfers that are scheduled five or more business days in advance. In addition to the disclosure obligations under the rule, providers, as I mentioned, also have cancellation and refund obligations. Under the rule, a sender generally has a right to cancel the transfer within 30 minutes of payment unless the transferred funds have been picked up by the designated recipient or deposited into an account held by the recipient. There's been some confusion about this, so let me spend a moment on this topic. The 30 minutes is tied to the provision of the receipt, so you would not provide a prepayment disclosure, then wait 30 minutes, then provide a receipt. For example, let's say a consumer enters your institution and asks to transfer $1,000 from her account to an account in Paris, and the consumer asks for the transfers to be received in euro. The institution provides the prepayment disclosure. If the consumer reviews the prepayment disclosure and decides to go ahead and authorize the transfer, 
The institution would then give her the receipt that has the same disclosed figures that were on the prepayment disclosure. Once the consumer receives that receipt, she has 30 minutes to cancel the transaction regardless of when the transaction is actually initiated or processed by the institution. We expect that due to the nature of certain types of transfers, in some cases providers will provide the receipt, wait 30 minutes, and then send the transfer. So in my example, the bank may decide to wait the 30 minutes before initiating the wire transfer. All that said, I do want to emphasize that the rate that's provided on the prepayment disclosure and the receipt is what the consumer needs to be provided. So if you decide to wait the 30 minutes before processing the transfer and rates do fluctuate after that 30 minutes is up, you'll still need to honor what was disclosed to the consumer. Hopefully this clarifies how cancellation works. I want to also state that the sender's request to cancel can be oral or written. It also can be given at an agent and it is effective when given at the agent. That said, there is no requirement for agents to resolve refund requests or, as I'll discuss in a moment, to resolve errors. This is purely a timing issue as to when the notice is effective. Then, once notice to cancel has been given, within three business days of receiving that request, the provider must refund the total amount of funds given by the sender, including fees, and to the extent not prohibited by law, taxes. So this slide lays out the general timeline and requirements for the error resolution process. Under the statute and the rule, the sender has 180 days to report an error. Again, this is from the statute. As with cancellation, the comment explains that notice to an agent is deemed notice to a provider. And as we explained in the preamble, senders that have a problem or issue with a particular transfer may contact the agent location that sender used to send the transfer to resolve the problem or issue rather than notifying the provider directly. And we heard consistently in consumer testing that if there's a problem, the consumer is going to go back to the location where they sent the transfer. And that is why a notice to the agent is, notice to the, is deemed notice to the provider. And the question has come up how this notice would operate in the non-agent context. For example, what happens if a bank customer no provides notice at a branch? Staff believes the same concept would apply in the non-agent context. That is, notice at a branch would be notice to the provider. This is where a customer is most likely to go to report an error. But again, we would note that the agent or the frontline employee are not required to perform error resolution procedures. And that person could direct the consumer to the right number or department for the actual resolution of the error, but the time tolls upon telling that agent or frontline employee. Once notice has been provided, the provider has 90 days to investigate and make a determination. Fees cannot be charged for the investigation. Then, the provider has three business days after completing the investigation to report the results. And note that the business day is defined in the rule. If an error occurred, the provider must correct the error within one business day or as soon as reasonably practicable after receiving the sender's instructions. And the sender's instruction will depend on the type of error and the remedy available. For example, the sender may elect a refund or to resend the transfer. One question was asked uh, whether the rule permits providers to offer immediate error correction without triggering the error resolution process. And the commentary does address this, and it states that a provider may correct an error without investigation in the amount or manner alleged by the sender or otherwise determined to be an error but must comply with all other applicable requirements of the error resolution provisions, including providing notice that the error was resolved. There are five errors in the rule, and the most important are listed here on this slide. Errors include incorrect amount of currency paid by a sender, an incorrect amount of currency received, and late or non-delivery of the remittance transfer. There are also exceptions from the definitions of error. With respect to the incorrect amount of currency received or late or non-delivery of the remittance transfer, there is an exception from the definition of error if a failure uh, res resulted from extraordinary circumstances outside the provider's control that could not have reasonably been anticipated. And the commentary explains that extraordinary circumstances include war or civil unrest, natural disaster, 
garnishment, or attachment of some of the funds after the transfer is sent, and government actions or restrictions that could not have reasonably been anticipated by the provider, such as imposition of foreign currency controls or foreign taxes that are unknown at the time the receipt or combined disclosure is provided. With respect to late or non-delivery, there is also an exception for delays because of OFAC and other fraud screens and due to friendly fraud. And one question that we've received is whether this would include delays caused by fraud screening or by BSA OFAC procedures or by entities other than the provider, for example, in foreign countries. Staff would read or similar laws or requirements in that uh, definition to include delays caused by BSA and OFAC procedures by entities other than the provider. As discussed in the preamble, though, we do understand delays to be infrequent. In other words, this covers out of the ordinary delays, not normal time required process, uh, uh, process these screens. Errors also don't include status inquiries, recipient requested changes, or changes in the amount or type of currency if the provider relied on information provided by the sender. If there is an error, remedies generally available include uh, refund or resending the transfer in an amount appropriate to correct the error. The resend generally has to be done at no cost to the consumer. If the error is a failure to make funds available, including late or non-delivery, then there is a separate remedy. The refund of taxes and fees are imposed, and taxes here only need to be refunded to the extent allowed by law. The exception to this is if late or non-delivery resulted from the sender providing incorrect or insufficient information. If the chosen remedy is to resend, then third-party costs actually incurred may be imposed on the resend. This relates to third-party fees, not the provider's own fees. Also, in this instance, the additional refund remedy does not apply. On this last point regarding incorrect or insufficient information, we do recognize that this is a challenging requirement. We previously said that we intended to monitor impacts closely, and as Director Cordray said today, we will be revisiting this issue. The statute also requires the Bureau to implement liability rules for providers, including ones that act through agents. The final rule states that the provider is strictly liable for violations by an agent when the agent acts on behalf of the provider. Agency is def generally defined by state or common law, so whether an entity is an agent of a provider is generally not something we can provide comment on. As I have said in several occasions already, uh, the rule does address remittance transfers that are scheduled in advance, whether this transfer is one-time or recurring, such as monthly, and we call those pre-authorized remittance transfers. In these circumstances, the rule does provide special timing requirements for disclosures for subsequent transfers as well as for the refund cancellation period. For a one-time transfer, or the first in a series of pre-authorized remittance transfers scheduled five or more business days before the date of transfer, Estimates are permitted in the prepayment disclosure and receipt provided when the transfer is scheduled. In this case, an accurate receipt is required after the transaction goes through, unless a statutory exception applies. For subsequent transfers, then, the prepayment disclosures are generally not required, and after the fact, an accurate receipt is required, unless, again, a statutory exception applies. There are also requirements relating to the disclosure of a transfer date and future transfer dates. Here, for one-time remittance transfers, scheduled three or more business days in advance, and for the first in a series of pre-authorized remittance transfers, in other words, the recurring transfers, the transfer date must be disclosed on the initial receipt and subsequent receipts. For subsequent pre-authorized remittance transfers along the series, the rule requires also the disclosure of the future date or dates of subsequent transfers, a statement about your cancellation, the sender's cancellation rights, and the contact information for the remittance transfer provider. And there's general flexibility on how this latter point is disclosed. As long as it's provided uh, no more than 12 months out and no fewer than business days before the transfer is scheduled. And the idea here is to provide the consumer with some sense of when these transfers are going out. <coughs> 
For subsequent preauthorized remittance transfers that are scheduled for or fewer business days out, the disclosure about future dates of transfer must be on the initial receipt for the first transfer. There are also requirements special here for uh, uh, with respect to cancellation and refund. And here for any remittance transfer scheduled at least three business days in advance, the sender must cancel at least three business days before the scheduled date of transfer. So if the transfer is scheduled one or two business days in advance, then the 30-minute cancellation period applies. The effective date for the final rule is February 7th, 2013. We've heard from a number of parties asking if the Bureau will delay the effective date. The Bureau does not plan to delay the effective date. In terms of what's next, I've already mentioned the countries list, and we published yesterday, as Director Cordray mentioned, a small business compliance guide, which is available on our website. We've included in that guide a number of non-legal practical implementation tips that might be useful in thinking about your compliance issues. We will continue to closely monitor the market and we'll continue working with you to provide guidance and to answer implementation questions. We appreciate all of the work that many listeners have already done towards compliance and your continued effort between now and February. We've also been receiving some questions about supervision and examinations and I did want to address a few of those today. One question is when the CFPB and other agencies will start examining remittance transfer activities at supervised entity. And the answer is, the Bureau is currently developing interagency examination procedures for bank and non-bank examinations that will be finalized before the remittance rules effective date of February 7, 2013. The Bureau's examination program is risk-focused, and the Bureau will schedule examinations in this area based on that general approach. In any event, Compliance is expected from the effective date of the rule, and examinations, when scheduled, will review an entity's activity throughout the review period established for that examination. In addition, if we identify significant compliance concerns through complaints or otherwise, the Bureau may use its enforcement authority in situations where an examination would be impractical or inefficient. Another question is, what is whether the CFPB is going to do a larger participant rulemaking in this space. The answer is, for non-depository institutions, the Bureau generally has authority to examine, among other covered persons, the larger participants in markets, which the Bureau defines by rules. The Bureau has issued a larger participant rule, for example, with regard to credit reporting, and has proposed a rule regarding debt collection. The Bureau is still in the process of deciding what the scope of any additional rules would look like and the timing for such rules. Even without a, a larger participant rule, however, there are other tools to protect consumers in this space. The Bureau does have authority to enforce. Further, the Bureau has authority to examine non-depository institutions for which we have reasonable cause to determine that the person is engaging in con conduct that poses risk to consumers. The Bureau is in the process of finalizing procedures regarding supervisory authority. Finally, how will the Bureau decide on which institutions to examine first? The Bureau's approach in selecting institutions to examine for compliance with the remittance transfer rules will be the same as other CFPB examinations. The Bureau will select institutions based on the risks to consumers. Our risk analysis may include consideration of the company's asset size, volume of consumer financial transactions, extent of oversight, and other factors determined to be relevant by the Bureau. We hope that this has provided a helpful overview for you of our rule. As Director Cordray explained at the opening, our work does not end once we've released a final rule. And in addition to this webinar, our team in the Bureau's Office of Regulations is available to address your specific questions about the rule. You can read us, reach us at our guidance hotline at 202-435-7700 or via email at cfpb underscore remittance rule at cfpb.gov. Please include your name, institution, and phone number in any messages to us. Please also note that there are many of you with questions, and we do want to give each question the appropriate attention that it deserves. That said, we will endeavor to respond to guidance questions as quickly as we can. Thank you again very much for your time and interest on this topic.